as I promised yesterday, I'll no, I'm not going to introduce a whole lot of new material today, essentially no new material. We're really just going to revisit some of the things, formulate them a little bit differently, and uh, hopefully you know, view things from a slightly different angle. So recall that all these direct solvers, they're based on some sort of hierarchical partitioning of the domain. So for the most part in this lecture, our, model, our toy problem is going to be a boundary into equation defined with some sort of contour in the plane. So we do this standard procedure. We take the original contour, define this as the root of a tree. So I'm going to use this notation extensively. So I1 is the entire index vector, in this case, 1 to 400. So we split this into its two children, which we label I2. and I3. And then continue down. And then once you have this, this immediately gives you a tessellation of a matrix. So in this very simplest form of rank structured matrix, this type of tree on the index vector corresponds directly to various tessellations of the matrix. So this is the easiest one. So I'm going to talk about this matrix extensively. So it looks something like this. Now the first time around, the first time we saw these matrices, which are called simple structured matrices, S matrices, we didn't really introduce much notation. Now let's do a little bit of notation. So I'm going to define, so I'm going to factor, recall that every off-diagonal block here is assumed to have finite rank. In practice, of course, the rank depends on the block, you compress these things dynamically and numerically determine the optimal rank, but you also keep notation reasonably uncluttered. We'll say that the rank of every off-diagonal block is k. So then what we're doing is that every one of these off-diagonal blocks we factor in this form. So now notice that in this format we have very long basis matrices. So in order to, uh, to represent this big block, I notice, you know, n here in a serious problem could be a million. So they, these blocks can be very large. So the long basis matrices, so here really is uh, U2, I suppose. And it's the long matrix. Since I'm a little out of space, I'm just going to put a little hat on it to indicate that it's long. And uh, right. so this is what I use to span the column space of this big block. And this is really one of the main reasons. The fact that these mat basis matrices are very long is the reason why this is not a very efficient method. Like sometimes you don't need a super efficient method, but if you just want to do something like accelerate the nested dissection method in 2D, then this will give you algorithms that have complexity n times some power of log n, and that's actually good enough to get overall linear complexity. All right, because in that case, you know, what's the the biggest 2D problem you would consider, you know, say you have 10,000 nodes on the side, that's 100 million degrees of freedom overall, and still this ACE matrix is really just a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. So it's not that big. Right. But uh, as you go to bigger problems, that would be difficult. So now this matrix format I introduced yesterday, the hierarchically block separable matrices, which many people refer to as HSS matrices, what we're doing there is that we have a more economical way of representing these bases. So in that format, you never store these long matrices explicitly. So instead, the additional condition, so an HBS matrix, you can view it as an, it's, it is an H matrix, uh, an S matrix. But then you make an additional requirement 
which is that I can express this long basis vector, for instance, u2 hat, in terms of the basis corresponding to its children. All right, so here we have u4, and this is u5. So this big index set is i2, and it splits into i4 and i5. Right. So now, suppose that I have these two matrices accessible. Then what that relation over here says is that then I can very cheaply express the long basis matrix is here. So this guy u tau over there is a small matrix. So the shape of that factorization, so what I'm saying here is, so here say it's a little too fat, we don't want big ranks. Okay, so here's u2 hat. And I'm going to factor this as follows. So here's u4 hat and u5 hat. And then the point is that u2, without the hat, it's not a long matrix. It's this guy is little. Like this. So this one has dimension k. 2k by k. So if I know these two matrices, then I can get this one by just storing this little k by 2k matrix. Because right. notice that if, if I were to store all the long basis matrices, how much storage do I need? So up here, this guy has length n half. So I need n half times k storage. I also need n half times k storage here. So overall, just for storing these two blocks, I need nk storage. Okay, now let's look at the next finer level. Storing this one, I need n divided by 4 times k storage. But now there are four of these. So nk storage on the next level as well. So every level requires nk storage, which of course leads to n log n times k overall storage. And that, of course, puts a lower bound on any, anything you want to do with this matrix. So even a simple matrix vector multiply is n log m times k. Whereas in this case, on the top level, think of k as being you know, reasonably small. At worst, it's going to be log k, uh, log n for, um, for this type of matrix when the underlying domain is uh, basically one dimensional. So the top level storage is essentially nothing. Right? All the storage is of the leaves. On the next level, you store half as much. On the next level, you store a quarter as much. So overall, you do the geometric sum, and you end up with uh, overall O of n storage. And uh, right. so now I showed it just for one step. Of course, in general, you telescope. So for this figure. Let's see. So in the top, so I'm looking at a little subtree here. So E has children A and B. And that's what this factorization is. So this is, so suppose now that you A and B are leaves. Then uh, the basis matrix on the next coarser level you express simply in terms of, so for the leaves, I should have said it was in the previous slide, but I never said it. The long basis matrices are just defined to be the short basis matrices. Right. These should not be longs, because these are leaves. But uh, so then you can express on the next level up. And the point here being that these things telescope. So then we have F, C, and D, and so on. So in order to express, if you wanted to express the long basis matrix for node G, you just recursively have to go down. So it's determined by the basis matrices for the leaves, and then a sequence 
basically a telescoping factorization here of the short matrices, right? So now this is what the matrix vector multiply looks like for an HBS matrix. And notice that this, this pattern is something we've seen many times. So we started, we introduced in this when we described the fast multiple method in lecture two. So it's, it's really basically the same structure. So we loop over the leaves. For each one, we go directly and look at the source vector. The vector of the original source is Q. We project these to some sort of economical representations for each one of the leaves. So that's this Q tau hat. So this is an outgoing representation for the leaf. Right? So then there's a loop from finer levels to coarser. I've written in here in a level by level fashion, but really the only requirement is that you can order the tree any way you want, as long as you process a parent after its children. And what you do here is that you simply compute the outgoing expansions in terms of the expansions of the children. So this looks very much like the fast multiple method. The only difference here, I suppose, is that uh, we always use binary trees here for various reasons. And um, yeah, so th this is really what I call an outgoing from outgoing translation operator. Okay? So then when you have all the out when you have all the outgoing expansions for all boxes at all levels. So notice that this is very different from Barnes Hut. So Barnes Hut you can see as an analog of the S matrix representation really, because then you would not have this second loop. You would just have the first one. So then the first loop would go over all boxes at all levels. And you would multiply by the long basis matrices. Of course in Barnes Hut you have an analytic formula for this, so there's no storage issue. But there's a lot of computation. All right. So then there's a downwards pass. Once you have all the outgoing expansions, that's you start at the roots of the tree and move down. So in order to construct, so if I have two nodes, sigma 1 and sigma 2, their parent is tau. So now suppose I want the incoming expansion for sigma 1. So what do I do? Well, I have the incoming expansion from its parent. So I translate this one, I expand that vector, and divvy it up among its children. So this is really the local to local translation operator, what I call an incoming from incoming translation expansion. And then, this is the analog of the interaction list in the fast multiple method, where you convert outgoing expansions to incoming expansions. And in this case, the interaction list really only has length one, because each guy just talks to its sibling. So going down here, this is done by applying u tau. And then these are the representations of the off-diagonal blocks. All right, two, one. All right. So I, I think I'm a little inconsistent in notation here. So what I sometimes call the B matrices, I sometimes call A tilde. Sorry about that. It's the same thing. But these are sibling interaction matrices. All right, so once you have the incoming expansions for all boxes at all levels, now in order to get back to the full vector of potentials U up here, then what you do is you loop over the leaves. You just expand the incoming expansion for each leaf. And then you add the self-interactions. Notice now self-interactions means only interactions with itself. The box talks only to itself. You do not need to collect contributions from neighbors because that's been compressed already. Any questions? Yes? Can you remark about what sort of operators would not be 
could not be discretized as an HBS matrix, but as an S matrix? Um, so, so in potential, so it's in potential theory, most of them can efficiently be represented as HBS. You know, we, we've used them for essentially all the applications that I'm talking about here. We're typically using HBS matrix representations, and uh, I know you know they're commonly used in uh, in constructing these accelerated nested dissection schemes. So in this context, they're very common, and. So what is the difference? So, so the difference is that when I, so for an S matrix to be an HBS matrix, what I need is not only that this guy has low rank, but I'm going to require, or I am requiring, but this has to be, what this works out to is that this has to, this little block here, it has to be a, it has to span all the rows in this very long matrix. And, you know, people use structured matrix uh, computations for compressing covariance matrices and various things in data mining and things like this. And in that case, you know, it's perfectly conceivable that, that there's really no reason to believe why matrix entries here should have anything to do with matrix entries here. In that case, the HBS matrix representation would not be good. Anything else? Maybe an observation and along the line of this question is it. You know, in the, in the first day when we were studying the interpretive decomposition, we sort of did a collection of sources next door to a collection of targets. Mm -hmm. And that probably would not be sufficient to get a good U collection for the whole area around it, right? You really do need to have sort of that proxy shell that gives you sort of the response in every direction, not just restricted to one specific tar set of targets. Is that yes, accurate? yes, that, that's, that's very accurate. So if I, Right, so, so what this says is that if I use the S matrix format, then this representation only has to compress interactions with its immediate sibling. So that rank will be lower. So th there are a couple issues, like one is when can you use HBS at all, and another one is when is it the most economical one. Because it could be that you, know, you can represent it as an HBS matrix, but the ranks will always be higher. Right? This is a strict mathematical bound. The, the ranks will be higher in the HBS representation than in the S one. Yeah, precisely for that reason. All right, so here we just explicitly write out some comparisons to the fast multiple method where we started. And uh, here's a little taxonomy, so just to show that these are some pairs that sort of have the same properties. We've talked about Barnes hat compared to the fast multiple method. So in the fast multiple method, everything is built hierarchically. In barnes hut you keep going back and talking directly. The, point, the original points talk directly to nodes higher in the tree, which is inefficient. And we have these S matrices and the HPS matrices also have the same sort of dualism. Uh, if you're a European, you will refer to these as H matrices and H2 matrices. So it's really basically the same concept. Do you represent the basis, basis matrices hierarchically in a nested way or not? Okay, so notice that now this morning I, I deliberately used slightly different language than yesterday. So I expressed this HBS matrix representation very much in terms of poten a potential problem. So really, you know, it, you, you can view it as pure linear algebra, but it's, it sort of, at least for me, helps intuition to think of it in terms of the physics. So let, let's go a little bit a step further in that direction and really see what are these various objects? What, what are their physical interpretations? So suppose we're given a set of points in some geometry like this. And uh, here is the node tau in red. So this is a subbox of the entire domain. So uh, what I'm doing here is I'm defining the outgoing expansion. When we use skeletonization, what this corresponds to is to pick a subselection of points and then you compute some equivalent charges on those points. So again, 
Notice that this representation, the economical, the compact representation of the outgoing field, it has to be valid everywhere else in the computational domain, even immediately outside. There's no buffer region here. So we already touched on this, but so the advantage of doing this is that you get simpler inversion, simpler LU factorization, things like this, but the ranks are certainly higher, and in general, in, in this environment, you cannot at all rely on analytical formulas. You cannot really, so when you, so in the context of um, fast multiple methods and generalized fast multiple methods, that you have lots of options for how to derive the expansions because the fields are very, very smooth. Everything that you're compressing is very smooth. So, you know, using harmonic expansions is, is very efficient, but you, you could, in principle, just use smoothness or something. That's very inefficient, but you could, in principle, do that. Here, you absolutely cannot. You just have to numerically compress things. All right, so for a parent node with children, in principle, the outgoing expansion is defined by exactly the same expression, but with the long basis vector. But then if you roll things out, you see that you don't need to do that expensive computation. You just get it directly from the outgoing expansions of its children. All right. So now let's, let's reformulate the derivation of this scheme a little bit. So I, I want to formulate this direct solver in terms of numerical scattering matrices. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to introduce an incoming potential explicitly. So what the incoming potential is, So we're looking at some subset of the original index vector. So there's a diagonal block. And then there's an off-diagonal block associated with this. Out here is the load. So here is Q. So the incoming expansion, or the incoming potential, I should say, not expansion, the original full representation, it's really the vector that's the off-diagonal block associated with node tau multiplied by the corresponding vector of sources. So you can write the equilibrium equation restricted to node tau. So now it's, it's really this term. This is g tau, by definition. OK, so notice that um, this block that I shaded here, the basis for its columns is u tau. So the point, actually to be precise, u tau long. But for now, we're talking about a leaf. So it's, it's the same. So what this means is that I can efficiently represent the incoming potential. I can express it in terms of the basis matrix u tau. All right. So in terms of skeletonization, if you have some domain gamma, then what we're talking about is so gamma tau is some subdomain. And the incoming potential here, it's the potential caused by sources on the rest of the contour. And I can efficiently represent it using skeletonization, which is to say that I sample it at a few different points here. And now what u tau does is that it interpolates to the remaining points. All right, everybody with me? 
So the point here is that now I can write the local equilibrium equation as a, things that involve only objects that are locally defined. I don't talk about the outside world anymore. All right. So now we start with uh, this local expression. Now left multiply by the, by the diagonal block. Then we get this equation. And next we're going to compress this because we want to look at this from the point of view of the outside world. So we multiply by the compression matrix V tau star in terms of physical terms. What V tau does is that it takes the source distribution here and it projects these to some sub-selection of source locations and puts some equivalent sources on. So this is what G tau tilde is. So now here's the local equilibrium, equilibrium equation. So the function of this numerical scattering matrix, S tau, it feels exactly the same function as the inverse of the diagonal block, but it's the compressed representation of that. So here's a, now a local equilibrium equation of size k by k, where k is the rank of both this shaded block and the corresponding thing in the other direction. So now, an important point is that, so, so, so this, this, is, this is critical, that the size of the scattering matrix depends only on the rank of interaction. It does not depend on what happens internally to this node, to this thing. So here, if I had, if I say I had some little heinous cusp here that I needed to do something very complicated to discretize accurately, those degrees of freedom don't contribute to the rank. Maybe slightly, but very marginally. If you have some very complicated behavior, if I have concentrations of loads, suppose there's some region where I need to resolve the right-hand side much more finely. If I do a multi-body scattering, I might have some other contour that comes up very close to it that necessitates me to resolve incoming potentials very finely. But the point then is that all these local refinements go away once you compress. So uh, here's one of these fun commutative diagrams that uh, you might find helpful, maybe not. If after this slide you didn't like this, you can forget about it. I think this is the last commutative diagram in these lectures. So, uh, so let, let's look again at the interaction between these two pieces in this, uh, you know, little model of a composite material or something. So, so what is physically the scattering matrix for the red block? Right, so from the point of view of the outside world, how does the outside world interact with this block? If you don't care about reconstructing the potential inside the block, then what's going on? So you, you start with, with charges on the outside world. So that corresponds to to this vector. These are the sources on the outside world. So they get mapped into the region of interest. And that happens via A12. So in this case, just to keep notation uncluttered, I call the outside world 2. So A12 here is this block. OK? So now in the uncompressed notion, then what you do is you apply the inverse the local equilibrium equation here, you invert that to find the, the sources on omega 1 that equilibrate the problem, that make sure that you, lo you locally satisfy the equilibrium equation. So this gives you some sources on the red points, and then these get mapped to the outside world via A21. But, so what we want to exploit now is that A12 and A21 have numerically low rank. So we can factor A12 as U1 times, or yeah, as U1 times A12 skeletonized. So we pick a subselection of rows, I suppose, of A12. So that corresponds to a subset of points in the red box. Okay? So then, in principle, if I, now that I have this factorization and I have a corresponding factorization over here, so now I, that allows me to go. So this is not a shortcut. 
But it, so then now I can go like this, ding, 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 and like that. So now the local scattering matrix is by definition the composition of these three maps. So you compute it once when you do compression, and then henceforth you can just go directly from the efficient representation of potentials to efficient representation of charges. So it encodes all this complexity inside the box. And if you use skeletonization, we can draw these little pictures. This corresponds just to a subselection of the collocation points. Right. So let's bore in a little bit on this uh, comparison with scattering matrices. So I've used this term scattering matrices, and some of you are very well familiar with this, but for others it might be a little bit of a novelty. So it's a classical object in mathematical physics. So what's going on here is that it's really inspired by scattering problems. So you have some source of radiation that generates a field. This gets mapped to some objects, which we call a scatter. It gets reflected. So if this is electromagnetism, you can think of this physically as what happens is you have an incoming electromagnetic field that generates currents in the surface, think of this, you know, it could be a metallic surface. These equilibrate the field to make sure the boundary conditions are satisfied on the surface. And then these surface currents generate the outgoing field, which is what you measure. So you measure the scattered field. So now there's some mathematical map that takes you from the incoming field to the outgoing field. That's the scattering matrix. Let's cast this mathematically. So uh, you can view the scattering matrix now as a composition of three maps. So you start with some charges, some sources on the scattering region. These get mapped via some kind of integral operator. So the, there are many ways of you know, encoding this mathematically. This is just one option. But uh, you can view this. So here we have this sources to potentials, the potential evaluation map that we talked about extensively. So these get mapped onto the scatter. On the scatter, the fields get equilibrated by solving, for instance, again, there are many mathematical formulation, but say we're doing acoustic scattering, then some sort of combined field into equation is nice. So you need to invert that to equilibrate the field on the scatter. And then the source distribution gets mapped by this map T out to go back to the observation region. <laughs> Okay, so this is what we need to express. Now, the key point here is that, and this is you know, a fact that has been well known for many, many years, that uh, these maps are highly ranked efficient. So for in, in particular, you can, uh, you can expand them in terms of various of these classical basis expansions. So if we're doing uh, electrostatics, then uh, these are spherical harmonics. If you're doing Helmholtz, then it's some variation of vessel functions, cylindrical or spherical. So, uh, so you know that these are numerically ranked efficient, meaning that you can expand them efficiently in some basis. So classically, this was done in an analytic basis. Now we do it numerically, but conceptually, it's really the same thing. So now the scattering matrix here is really the local solution operator projected onto the relevant basis functions. And you need a small number of basis functions is basically the point here. All right. So now just look at, so look at the similarity between, so here we have the numerical notion of a scattering matrix, and here's the classical physical one. So it, they're really very closely related concepts. And in view of Leslie's lecture yesterday, Let's see if we can um, look at this. Right. So what I'm going to plot here I might actually turn the lights on. Or no, we're going to I can erase here.
So remember the situation that Leslie talked about. So we have some outside region where, it's where we apply a field and then measure the response. And then there's some scattering stuff inside. So in this case, here's the scatter. This outside circle is both the incoming and the outgoing contour. So we apply a potential out here. This maps inside via T in. And then you have some T gamma that you invert, and then it gets mapped out via T out. Okay. So the, the point here being that these guys are rank deficient. And for Laplace, for electrostatics, they're very strongly rank deficient. So if you recall from the first couple lectures, we, this, this is precisely the problem we talked about. So what we're doing here, if we're doing electrostatics, so you specify the incoming potential via its Dirichlet data on the outside. So we precisely constructed the solution operator. So it's expansions in the sine p theta times rp And now the critical point is that as p increases, as you look at more and more high frequency content on the outside circle, these things localize to the boundary. So let's just look at that. OK, so here's the second basis function. This is, so I'm plotting just the cosines here. So it's half of it. So I cut it in half just to improve visibility. So here's cosine times r, which is just a linear function. So notice that these guys penetrate well. You know, they, they, are, they go through the entire domain. Here is the next one. This is the p equal to 2 term. So these are really quadratics. So it's you know, x1 squared minus x2 squared. It's the harmonic polynomial of degree 2. This is 3 four, and so on. And now you see that as these increase, the key point is that they, they get very localized to the boundary. There's really nothing here. So now try to resolve a fine geometry in here, a fine field in here in these basis functions. You know, it will have a nice inner product with the leading ones. So you will certainly see that there's something there. You can find something like the total mass or something of the interior scatter. But if it's far inside, it's, this is really a horrible basis to get any accuracy out of it. And uh, notice that there are, there are many sources of smoothing here. There's a map that maps you inside, then there's a local solution operator, and then there's a map that goes outside. So the first and the last, at least, are strongly smoothing. And notice also that the solution to this is not to you know, get more accurate sensors or something, because it's exponential decay. Say we have half the region in here, then uh, if you double the precision of your sensors, you really only gain one Fourier mode. So you know, this, this will quickly get expensive. Now let's look at Helmholtz. All right, so here the Helmholtz parameter is 5. So it's uh, about one wavelength across. And uh, now the, base, the functions look a little bit differently. Now this is p equal to 1, p equal to 2, 3. But pretty quickly the same thing happens, that these concentrate to the boundary. So you, know, you, you really shouldn't try to do any detailed imaging in this regime. Right, this is just 15. This is Fourier mode 15. And it's already essentially identically zero in the interior. OK, so what we'll do next is that we'll crank up the wave number. Um, 
Now let's do 50. OK, so Helmholtz parameter 50. Now this is what the basis function looks like. This is the leading one. This is number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And notice that these all penetrate. They, they go beautifully into the interior of the domain. So in these, you, you can actually expand a lot of stuff. They, these are good basis functions for expanding stuff in the inside. But if you go high enough, now notice that something is starting to happen in the middle. Let's go a little bit higher here. If I had thought of this earlier than this morning, I would have had a step in your head functionality. OK, so now we're at 35. Now they're starting to zero out in the middle. So w what we're seeing here is this ability to see stuff that's resolved at the size of the wavelength for the problem. But you should not try to do finer than that, unless you're happy with getting pretty rough information. I mean, if, if, you're, if it's OK for your application, to just have the first 30, 40 modes or something accurately, then you know it's perfectly fine. But don't try to ask for too much. Here is really the point. And this, this drop-off happens. You know, we, we've talked about how these expansions drop off. You have no decay for a long while. That corresponds to these guys having fully penetrating into the domain. And then you have the drop-off point. Um, and just a term that we've used, let me tie that in here. So, so the set of functions that are nicely expanded, that are nicely spanned at a certain frequency, th this is really is a set of ba band-limited functions. Um, any questions about this? No? All right. So another very nice application of this, I already mentioned this briefly. Now think about how this is useful for compressing corners. So suppose we want to solve an equation on this corner. So now the angle here is somewhat steep, so you get various singularities. They're differently strong, whether you're looking at an interior problem or an exterior problem. But in either case, you need to do something, because these over here, the function is not well represented in a polynomial on this big panel. That's going to incur a fair substantial error. So now there are a couple ways to go. You can, be, you can be smart. You can think about this and do some asymptotic calculations and find what's the leading order of the singularity. And you cook that into your basis function somehow. And in that case, you know, it, that works very well when it works. But it's, it's a little labor intense. And it's... Uh, it is perfectly doable in 2D. In 3D, it starts to get a little messy because these things are parameterized by more than one variable. So just a corner, you know, has at least two variables. And if you think of an edge, it's really starting to get quite messy. So I like to not think. So the approach that uh, I prefer here is to just refine. So you do some refinement strategy. The mindless thing to do, which again is something I like, is, uh, is to just do uh, dyadic refinements here. So you take this panel, you notice, oh, I don't get enough accuracy on it, so let's cut it in half. Then you get fine accuracy on this panel because it's well separated from the corner. You get poor accuracy on this one, so you cut it in half, and then you go on. All right, now the drawback of this strategy is that it leads to adding a lot of extra discretization nodes. So this guy here, you know, it's maybe 100 or 200 panels. For a smooth contour like this, 200 notes is perfectly sufficient to give you essentially double precision accuracy. But here, you, you might find that you need to add thousands of points just to resolve one corner. So now if you couple this with an iterative method, various unfortunate things happen, right? Because every iteration now gets very expensive because you have to involve all these thousands of notes that you added. But if you compute the scattering matrix of this corner, all this goes away. The size of the scattering matrix for the corner depends only on the rank of interaction between the red and the blue region. 
and that's almost independent of the local behavior over here. Okay, so we're currently working on extending this to three dimensions. This is something if I have time, I was going to spend the last the moments of the second lecture looking at numerical examples. So we looked at this with, uh, with Adriana and with James Bremer. Um, and we got very high accuracy discretizing a domain like this, using precisely just refinements at the corners and then compression. So here's another example. So this is something I did with uh, my students, Patrick Young and Sija Howe. So this is something we touched on in the first lecture. So the, this is set up to be difficult for iterative solvers, because what's happening, if you want to solve scattering here, you have an incoming wave. There are two issues. There's bouncing back and forth between the scatterers. But then even worse is that the waves go inside these guys and bounce around a lot. So you typically would need a very large number of iterations to get this fully resolved. But what we can do is, uh, so this is the, these are the discretization nodes required for this domain. This is to five or seven digits or something. Skeletonize it, sky, and it's like this. This is for Laplace, I think. For Helmholtz, you need more points, but just to illustrate the principle. So just the difference between that picture and this picture. You, you really get rid of, by local computation, you can filter out a lot of the points. It's like computer scattering matrix for each one of these individual scatter, scatterers. OK, so let's return. Now, now we've talked extensively about what these scattering matrices, matrices mean. Now how do you compute them? So recall that this is the local equilibrium equation restricted to no tau. We start with this formula, which involves it's of size n by n, where n is the number of discretization nodes inside tau. You compress, and you get a system of size k by k, where k is just the rank of interaction with the outside world. Right. So if tau is not a leaf, so, so for a leaf node, you just do this by brute force. I tau, you, you, should, dis, you should chop things up finely enough by computing this as cheap. You know, for small problems, dense linear algebra is very fast. If I tau is of a size a few hundred, or even a few thousand might be a good choice in certain cases, you can invert this very quickly. You know, it's, it really doesn't take long. But, uh, but what about the nodes higher up in the tree? So if I tau is long, then you can't really just... OK, so here we go. So here's the expression for the scattering matrix for a parent node. And you can't just do this by brute force, because n tau could be very, very large. But you don't have to. So just as you can aggregate outgoing expansions in this hierarchical way, you can also aggregate scattering matrices. So the scattering matrix of tau can be expressed in terms of the scattering matrices of its children, combined with these short basis vectors, and then the sibling interaction matrices. Okay. So we have this formula. And uh, notice that this, this is very doable computing. So the thing you need, to, so the expensive part here is to do this inversion of a matrix of size 2k by 2k. This you have to do, you know. But k is hopefully not too large. Here's the proof, but uh, we don't want to displease Leslie, so let's uh, move past it. <laughs> so uh, let, let me, instead of proving it, let me uh, indicate Make it likely, make it plausible to you why it should look like that. Because this, this is actually a fairly standard expression. It might not be immediately obvious, but let's, let's do it without compression. So if we write the equilibrium equation for node tau, let's just write out the coefficient matrix in terms of, its, of the contributions from its children. Then le left multiply by sort of the local scattering matrices for the children. Then you get this expression, and now what we wanted to do, and then we apply the inverse of uh, the coefficient matrix here, and you get the following equation. And notice here you have something that looks very much like the formula for recursive merging of the scattering matrices. So once you've seen this, 
I'm hoping that it will at least be not, not seem strange to you that, that this is what the formula looks like. And then uh, if you want to see the exact proof, you can uh, go to this paper with, uh, with James and Adriana. It's all laid out. All right, so at the top, there's very little to do. You just do a brute force inversion. And uh, then you get the following algorithm. So I'm, I'm not going to go into details. The point here is just to show that the resulting algorithms, you know, deriving them and understanding what's happening can be a little, it uh, can take a little bit of work. But at the end of the day, the, the resulting algorithms are really quite clean. So as long as you don't need to go in and use internal structure of the scattering matrices, the algorithms are very clean. So this is the build stage. This is where we build the scattering matrices, and more importantly, so it turns out that the scattering matrices serve basically the same functions as what Ariana described about this poincaré steckler scheme where we built Dirichlet-Neumann operators, that uh, the fundamental building block are Dirichlet-Neumann operators, but we really drop them. We don't need them. Once you process the Dirichlet-Neumann operators of two children, you can delete them to save memory. They're really only used to build the actual, what we call, solution operators, the factors in the inverse of the matrix. So that's exactly what's going on here. So it's really this matrix Z of T of tau. This is what we're going to need to actually solve the problem. And then on the leaves, we need this H of tau. So this is the build stage. And then the solve stage is really just, it follows exactly the same pattern. I don't want to go into details here, but there's an upwards pass where you build all the outgoing expansions. And then there's a top level solve, and then there's a downwards pass. Any questions? Um, right. So notice the, that there's not very much communication here. As long as the scattering matrices don't grow, that's a separate issue which needs to be dealt with. But if the, if the ranks don't grow too badly as you go up the tree, then there's very little communication. The box only talks to its parent, to its children, and to its sibling. So these are the complexities that you get. I'll go a little fast because we talked about this yesterday, and uh, I'll, I'll return to this point in the final talk, in the second talk today. Um, but the, the basic point being here that the reason you get a not so nice complexity in higher dimensions is that the scattering matrices grow large, that the ranks of interaction, if you have, say, a volume filling set of points in R3, then uh, you really get a lot of points aggregating in the interfaces at the top. So what you can do here is that you can use, uh, these are very physical objects, they're scattering matrices, so they themselves have internal structure, which you can, so you can code up, you know, a secondary hierarchy that uh, exploits the fact that these scattering matrices behave like interoperators operators and code it. And uh, the people who have actually gone through this, Eduardo and Adriana, and you know, so a variety of people who have done this. And it, it's really, it's, it's quite a mess. It, it's conceptually a fairly straightforward thing to do, but actually executing it is hard. And I thought about this a bit, and I, and I decided to not really cover it in any detail in these lectures, because it's, we, we really don't know yet what, the, what is the best way of doing these things. But I, I wanted to have things that I think most of the things I've said, if I watch these lectures in 10 years, I hope I won't be. I'm, I'm reasonably I'm not too concerned that I'll be embarrassed. But if I talked about this step, then, you know, I, you know this could be anything I say now could be completely invalidated in two years. So, um, so for that, I'll really simply refer to the original papers. It's, it's, this, this is where the research front is right now. All right, any questions? If not, we'll take a break and continue at 10.30. Thank you.